can be seated. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. If I were living my exact same life, working as a rabbi, partnering and raising my children, but I happen to live somewhere in the state of Texas, there is a good chance that one night while eating dinner or cleaning the dishes or while saying the bedtime Shema to Nadiv, I would get a knock on the door. And with that proverbial knock on the door would be people on the other side claiming that I was a child abuser. Then that person or persons claiming to protect my child would threaten to take away my children from me and from John and could quite possibly one day, not too far down the line, succeed in doing so. There is 100% certainty that if we lived in the state of Texas, a state in which I have colleagues and friends, that I would wake up every morning and go to sleep every evening in fear of that knock, unexpected knock at the door. I just want to invite us to take that in for a moment. This is not a drill. This is happening now, 1,500 miles from where we sit today. Since Governor Abbott, Governor Greg Abbott, directed the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services to investigate and punish parents that have sought trans-affirming health care for their children just one month ago, dozens, if not hundreds, of cases have been opened, like the ones I described. Abbott, citing a Texas law that equates such care with child abuse, is actively seeking the separation of children from parents that love them and support them. Despite condemnation from the federal government and a state judge's order to block the agency from such investigations, the Texas government agency is continuing to follow the governor's directive. It is difficult to underscore just how dangerous what, hap what is happening in Texas is. It's dangerous for the impacted children and teens because it reinforces for them the greatest fear that any human being can have, that they are not loved or accepted for who they are. And this can have dangerous and disastrous consequences. It's dangerous for parents who want, who now have to choose between affirming their children or losing their parenting rights. It's dangerous because it is an example of government overreach and an invasion of privacy inspired by sinister motives. It's dangerous because it is part of a political strategy that says that it is okay to endanger the lives of those who are vulnerable in order to activate a political base to win elections. 147 anti-transgender bills have been introduced just in the year 2021 in a record 34 states. Texas is not an outlier when it comes to transgender children also. Legislation specifically to block trans-affirming, gender-affirming care for minors has been introduced in 21 states in this past year alone. Trans kids and families of trans kids need our love 
our support, and our protection. In the worst of times, as well as in the best of times. While the details of my child's journey are private and for him to share or not share, I want to talk for a few moments about what I have learned as a parent in the last two and a half years in a way that respects his privacy but shares some of my learnings as I've gone through my own journey. And I just want to make an aside about privacy, which is that no one should ever ask a trans person about what they choose to do with their body ever, just as you would never ask a cisgender person that same question. So when my son, Mint, came out to us two and a half years ago, we were admittedly a little surprised. We didn't necessarily see that in early childhood, but we were also immediately accepting and supportive. And I notice that when I speak to people, they often push or prod me to see what sadness or regret or loss I might have, as if it's assumed that I do. And I can honestly say that that has not been the case for us. Before living in New York, I had been a rabbi in two different communities with wide gender diversity. I had acquaintances and families of friends who are transgender, and it was an immediate love and acceptance. And I thought that the support and enthusiasm of me and John would make this experience and journey one of rainbow unicorns and pride cakes. And I want to say there is fun and there is joy exploring identity, questioning everything, and celebrating and gaining a diverse community. But in the time in these past years, through the eyes of my own child and through the children in our extended LGBTQ community, I have also come to better understand the day-to-day -day struggles of many transgender youth. And no one, everyone is unique, everyone is different. I'm just sharing my observations. It's the struggle of identifying one way, but being afraid that that is not the way you will be seen or known in the world. Maybe you'll go to school and the teachers will use your correct name and pronouns, but maybe the kids won't. Or maybe if they do, what happens when I just walk outside of the spaces that feel safe? What will a waiter in a restaurant call me? When I go to a haircut, what will they say? What is the name that the doctor's office has on file? And what name will they use when they call me up when it's my turn? What is the feeling of having to use a passport and have a name that has been chosen not used, but the name that I have chosen to separate from and wish, in fact, to bury. It's called a dead name in trans communities because it's a name we want to bury. And have that name be something that is called out and said over and over again. Day-to-day -day life for some trans kids is like walking a minefield full of potential traps that may trigger painful memories or feelings that make you feel battered and exhausted. So calling people by the right pronoun and by their chosen names isn't just something that's good to do. It's a sacred act that communicates respect and dignity and can enable people to feel seen and affirmed. Making mistakes is fine perfectly fine, but correcting mistakes and moving swiftly and simply can be an act of healing. For many trans youth, there are struggles that come with the disconnect between your sense of yourself and your body. And this disconnect and discomfort can lead to anxiety and depression. And I want to say this really importantly, this is regardless of how supportive your family is. 
According to the studies, studies by the Center for Disease Control, transgender youth report significantly increased rates of depression, suicidality, and victimization compared to their cisgender peers. In the year of the study, 2017, one in three transgender children had attempted suicide. One in three. In contrast, new studies by the Trevor Project show that interventions like hormone therapy lower instances of depression and suicidality in transgender youth. Trans-affirming care, which covers a huge range of services, is healthcare. Trans-affirming care is life-saving care. It is the opposite of abuse. It is a manifestation of love and a commitment and an extension of B'Tselem Elohim, the value that every person is made in the divine image and should be given the dignity they deserve. So what do we do 1,500 miles away? First and foremost, for those sitting here or wherever you are outside of the LGBTQ community or even just outside of the trans community, we keep educating ourselves and pushing ourselves to be good allies, including being attentive to pronouns, not assuming gender identity, and standing up against these laws whenever we can. We can donate to organizations like the Trevor Project or Keshet or other important organizations. And just as importantly, we do as our ancestors did in this Parsha. We work on building our Mishkan, our sacred community. At the end of this week's Parsha, as I've mentioned before, we hear about the cloud. There's a cloud that covers the Ohel Moed and the presence of the divine is felt. And when the cloud is present, the people stay. And when the cloud lifts, the people go. In Jewish thought, these clouds represent many things, but one of them in many sources is divine protection. They are a physical layer of protection because they allow those who are under threat to be covered so that their enemies cannot pursue them. And they are an emotional level of protection because when the people see these clouds, they know that they are held and they are taken care of. So when we create communities that joyfully affirm instead of tacitly accept, when we commit, create communities that stand up to the fight for our rights against transphobia, racism, anti-Semitism, and so on, when we create communities where we sing and pray together and we care for one another as equals, when we ask everyone to give Nadiv Lev the generosity and the fullness of their hearts, then we allow the divine clouds to surround us and to surround all of our children. We provide comfort and protection, love and healing to all who are inside. That is the work. That is the work. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are about to bring in kids. And I just want to make sure we say, this is the first time that we've brought in the kids since the beginning of the pandemic two years ago. But I want to say that, that in that spirit, we're bringing these children into our community, right? We don't know yet who they are. Who, they don't yet know who all the who they are. And we're going to love them and commit to be with them no matter what. We love you, kiddos. We're so happy to see you. And we now turn to our, um, our handout and uh, invite you to sing along with us, Hava Nashira. No, yes, Hava Nashira. Yes. Hava Nashira! Hava, Hava. 